Step one, go to YouTube. Step two, type in how to, followed by any letter of the alphabet. Step three, enjoy such suggestions as how to solve a Rubik's Cube, how to jump higher, how to impress a girl, how to make slime without borax, which I did not investigate further. Skimming through these search results, the first questions that arise in my mind regard the producers and the audience of this content. Who considers the production of borax without slime such an integral skill for human achievement that they spend the time and effort to produce that video? It may sound surprising, but their efforts are not in vain. In fact, data released by Google just two years ago shows that searches related to how-to content are growing 70% year over year with over 100 million hours of this content watched in America so far this year. This shocking statistic proves that yes, in fact, there is an audience for non-Borax slime making, along with a whole host of predictive texts that we can barely imagine. I too have contributed to the how-to community of YouTube uh, by publishing an oil change video for my motorcycle. Uh, I was inspired by the helpful hints available from YouTubers whom I can only identify as exceedingly altruistic bikers. When I changed the hand grips on my old Suzuki and all the work I did on my old Harley Davidson, I had my tools, I had the owner's manuals, and I had YouTube open. All these feats were equally accomplished in independence and with helpful, anonymous, digital citizens. I'm also old enough to remember consulting Microsoft Encarta CD-ROMs for help with social studies projects. These, along with my teachers, parents, and local library were the only resources available. Then suddenly, the advent of internet searches was ushered in by a cowboy yodeling, Yahoo! Modern students know little of, this, of these dark times. They instead have access to heaps of information uh, through advanced search engines. In fact, when I googled the phrase Google search engine, Google provided 30,200,000 results in 70 hundredths of a second. What does this power signify for us? Well, we must recognize that the demands of the classroom are not always the same as the demands of life. In school, we can count on our teachers, who take time during and after class to ensure that we understand with growing mastery their course content. However, there are steps built into our school years that prepare us for greater independence and how much one can learn simply by one's own will and a device screen. Here on this stage, I will explicate the equal importance of demonstrating self-reliance and knowing when to ask for help. Whether your middle school years are now occurring or far in the annals of your past, it is healthy to test the limits of your own capacities and to assess the resources around you, human and digital, whom you can trust. When I was younger, so much younger than today Never needed anybody's help in any way But now those days are gone, I'm not so self-assured Now I find a change of mind and I've opened up the door I've always considered myself... Thank you. I've always considered myself an independent person, proud of the ability to go it alone. However, I fared poorly with home piano lessons because I did not practice consistently. I was embarrassed to ask my teacher for help uh, because I suspected the questions he might interpret as overly simplistic. My progress in school band was similarly inhibited. In retrospect, I recognized that I should have sought extra help, especially because I've always loved music and even then wanted to be a professional musician. However, pride and lethargy derailed me from that path. At the time, Neither the piano nor the clarinet sparked enough interest in me to commit my time or effort fully. Quitting those lessons was a relief at first, but ultimately became a source of massive regret. I interpreted my lack of progress as an emblem of personal weakness, which in many ways I suppose it was, as I failed myself without really trying. I'm therefore indebted to my older brother, a brilliant pianist for whom the gift of an acoustic guitar bared little interest. If I remember correctly, he learned a single Pink Floyd song from a tablature book and then reconciled the instrument into inert oblivion under the bed in the room we share. Racked with adolescent guilt and regret at quitting music lessons and overcome with curiosity, I decided after a number of weeks to crack that guitar case open and try my hand at it. I was impressed by my brother's entirely self-driven accomplishment. Using the same tablature book, 
and a foundational understanding of half steps and whole steps on a piano, I learned to navigate the fretboard. These early efforts had me hooked. First, I played single notes and built calluses on my fingertips. Then I memorized basic chord formations. Using a tape deck and a small microphone, I practiced basic versions of my favorite songs, learning in time to sing and play simultaneously. All this was accomplished through spare hours of happy solitude in my childhood bedroom. Dedicated and meticulous self-teaching allowed me to play my first live gig at 17 years old and make music a viable part-time job by earning my first paycheck two years later. Since then, I've toured a singer-songwriter act across several American states while also holding down a, a full-time job. None of this was accomplished by taking traditional music lessons, and I understand that my learning is not nearly complete. This skill is the result of pure passion and independent commitment. When we identify our passions early on and work towards success in them, we know that the work is hard and is often completed on our own terms. In other words, learning can be a solitary endeavor. I would argue that even those musicians who learn traditionally with lessons from a master player understand that reality. Perhaps a lesson lasts two hours and scheduled once a week. That leaves 166 unsupervised hours wherein a student will only practice independently. Due to lack of interest, that freedom was too great for me in piano and band lessons. However, when I started learning guitar, I wish there were more than 168 hours in a week. And there were times when I mused at how much more proficient I might be had I studied under a master player. However, I committed instead to making my style my own. If these challenges sound familiar to you, know that you're not alone. In fact, though many college graduates pursue one or several graduate degrees, many more will not attain their goal. One recent survey of graduate programs shows the attrition rate in doctoral programs of study is as high as 40 to 50 percent. So that means roughly half of doctoral candidates will never petition to graduate. Certainly, such a statistic it suggests immense adversities along the way. So the same study cites the lack of satisfactory dissertation progress as a causal factor. In other words, failures along the way ultimately derail these students' dreams. Did they ask too much of themselves? Did they not seek appropriate help from their professors? Did they lose interest with perpetual scholarship? When we picture ourselves attaining that goal that is nearest to our hearts, we guess at the obstacles we must overleap and even plan on how to conquer them. Then inevitably, setbacks pile up and make us question our own capacities. But we forget that our passions pick us, and not the reverse. Interests attract you for any number of reasons. That's why the Latin roots in the word avocation mean calling. Our interests call out to us and lead us toward them. But you need not follow that call alone. If I have wings, you need to go for no one can feel those of your needs that you won't let show. They're very kind. Because of the time period, I had limited accesses uh, to resources to learning the guitar. Were I to begin today, the internet would undoubtedly constitute the source of my independence. Want a more consistent jump shot? Financial advice. Better dance moves. Fresher smelling sneakers. All of these goals used to require interpersonal tutelage from an expert. Now, that tutelage can be had remotely, often without charge, and at a self-directed pace. However, there is an inherent danger to this style of learning. Because these nuggets of self-improvement are so easily had, some people dupe themselves into believing that they know more than they do. Therefore, we must remember not to lean too heavily on our self-directed learning and pair what we learn with guiding voices who can keep our egos in check. That caveat retains the independence piece and adds a healthy dose of personal accountability. Just because your friends, family, and acquaintances may not be directly instructing you in the necessary steps to reach your goals does not mean that those people play a less important role in your success. Share your dreams with them. Allow them to become your accountability partners, to remind you of why you started and how fulfilling success will be. Consider the phrase, no man is an island. Each of us is blessed with those individuals in our lives who are willing and ready to support us 
in our many endeavors. Many of us are unwilling to humble ourselves enough to rely upon others. It can be difficult to ask for help because of pride. However, it does not come at the cost of your own self-efficacy to reach out. In fact, the humility inherent in that choice demonstrates the admirable quality of self-awareness. And at times when you find yourself alone on the path to success, don't forget that it is possible to attain reasonable and specific goals purely on your own auspices. Maybe that's what the song is about. What if the me we're supposed to lean on is ourselves? Thank you. <laughs>